Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David Leonhardt and his guest, Mayor of the City of Chicago, Rahm Emanuel. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Thanks for flying me out. <laughs> Free trip, man. So uh, the mayor you've probably heard of before, uh, worked in the Clinton administration, worked in the Obama administration, uh, is known uh, as a very dynamic, forceful political figure. What, what he's not so well known for, but it's true, is that he's an education wonk. Uh, I wrote uh, an 8,000 word, uh, somewhat wonky piece for the New York Times Magazine in the middle of the, uh, the height of the financial crisis in 2009 when he was busy as uh, White House Chief of Staff and my phone rang one day and uh, it was not yet the mayor but it was Rahm Emanuel wanting to talk about the community college aspect about 7,000 words into the article. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so It was a short conversation. <laughs> there was no verbs or adjectives in there. <laughs> And so that was when I realized just how interested in higher education you were. And of course, um, it's become much more public and much clearer with the community college plan. So mm -hmm. basically what you've done in Chicago is you've said community college is free. And I guess where I want to start is how is that a change, right? When the president said he wanted to do this and he oh. specifically cited Colorado, uh, Chicago and Tennessee as models, a lot of people said, well, look, effectively, community college is pretty close to free already if you look at the statistics. So why is it meaningful to go out and say we're going to make community college free? Well, let me try to create a context uh, uh, first. Uh, and the main goal is 12th grade is 20th century. Two years post high school is 21st century. You can't say that since 80% of the jobs are coming to that are today and will be there tomorrow will require a minimum of two years of post high school education and you do nothing about it. And so where every other city is on a kindergarten to 12th grade model, we did universal full day kindergarten for every child in my first term. We're now doing, this is the first year, in the first week basically, uh, universal pre-K for all four year olds from a family of need. And then what we set up were three things, but of community college is the key. We have the second largest system in America. Each school has an industry focus. So one school is healthcare, one school is transportation, distribution, logistics. The industry does the curriculum and training, et cetera. If you get a B average, we make community college free. I do not want a parent taking a second job or a second mortgage to give their kids a chance at the American dream. And you can't say that 80% of the jobs coming to America require post high school education and you do nothing about it. And so that's the fundamental core. Now we made ours. Tennessee, uh, there's no uh, grade level. Right. Uh, the president, I think, has a C plus. Uh, we did a B plus. We had 1,100 kids, uh, just shy of 1,100 apply, and we now have uh, 900 just shy in the in of the uh, cohort that went in. This is our first year. In addition to that, at our high schools, we now starting next year, Dunbar will be all trades, carpentry, electrical workers, etc. We have uh, the largest military high school system in America. Air Force run a high school, Marine run a high school, Army run a high school, largest junior ROTC. Each of those schools have 80% graduation rate, 90% college attendance. I want to be the first school system that has a post high school education model for every child. And the community colleges are key to my, that strategy. So is the armed forces, so are the trades. And I don't think you can talk about what t today and tomorrow is going to be about if you don't revamp your educational system. I apologize, but I never know if I'm going to get another word in, so I wanted to take all that time. <laughs> <laughs> so what is, has it made a difference? I mean, so one of the things people said is, look, community college is already so cheap when you take into account financial oh. aid. You're not actually going to bring a lot more kids in. That's, uh, they'll fly you out to Chicago. I'm not going to pay for it, but come on out to Chicago. First of all, uh, you know, I call Chicago the most American of American cities. I agree with it's that. It's immigrants from all over the world. Uh, my grandfather came to Chicago in 1917 to get away from the pogroms. Fifth grade education, 13 year old, by himself, not a word of English. His grandson's the mayor of the city of Chicago. It's the greatest city, represents cultures from all over. We have 130 plus languages spoken in our public school system. So we did an opening for the parents and the kids who were part of this first cohort. Parents were literally 
Now, not a lot of parent, I'm not a person you approach wanting to fall into my arms and cry. That's just not me, okay? <laughs> parents were just, uh, uh, just crying and said, you know, I came to this country. Not all the parents are immigrants, uh, but I did not, my wife and I did not know what we were uh, going to be able to do to get our child, why we came here, et cetera. It's made a fundamental difference. I will also tell you, this is thumbnail. I don't have scientific evidence on our first year. But the lion's share of the kids are going on to four-year institutions. And uh, they're doing their first two years for free because that's what uh, parents need to make the other two years. Remember, they have four or five kids, three kids, et cetera. Um, and I can think of this Nigerian father specifically in the front row when we did this. I mean, this was why he came to America and he can fulfill his goal for his child. And they have to earn it. I do believe fundamentally in what President Clinton used to say, with responsibility comes opportunity. If you earn a B average, why should a parent take a second mortgage or a second job to give you a shot at a future? It's ridiculous. And so I want to make sure our kids are set up. Now, the other thing on the upside for us, so we dedicated a school to transportation, distribution, logistics, a la Harvey. UPS runs it with FedEx, CSX, Norfolk Southern, et cetera. Aerotrom is building the largest air cargo intermodal, intermodal facility at a gateway airport in Chicago, 12,000 jobs. Not the reason, I mean, O'Hare has big runways, that's kind of a big deal too, uh, but because we can guarantee a flow of people with CDL, truck driver license, was the reason they picked O'Hare. Whole Foods is putting their first grocery store at a food desert across from Kennedy King, which is our culinary hospitality. Why? They have a trained workforce right there. It has helped me recruit companies, create jobs in the city, because the biggest challenge today, companies, certainty around workforce. And the community colleges in Chicago were rated the worst. What World Bank two years ago called it the best career skill program in America. So that actually leads to an important point, which is obviously you want to avoid a situation in which you're getting these kids in, which mm -hmm. is great and then they're not getting good educations, right? And there are a lot of community colleges out there that have graduation rates that are below 30%. So how, what are you doing to make sure that we're not getting these kids into programs where five years from now they'll have a little debt and they'll have no degree? A little debt. Uh, and no degree. Yeah. I, well, I'm going to be honest. Uh, I'm not saying I, Mayor Daley did a couple of certain things in 2010, and then we picked up the baton on that. Uh, the truth is, the community colleges prior were the fifth and sixth year of your high school education. And you had to be honest. It was, a it was a disaster in Chicago. We have seven campuses, 115,000 kids, roughly. And I say kids. There's people going, returning, et cetera. So it's not just kids right out of high school. Um, and so uh, we revamped it. And there was a moment that it dawned, I will say, well, I've been involved in community colleges as a congressman. Wright Community College was in my district and very involved in it, is I was recruiting Dow Chemical to open up a, a larger operation in Chicago. And they were talking about they have a relationship with the Kellogg Business School where they do the curriculum because that's where they want a specific kind of training. And I was looking at myself and I said, well, if Dow can do it with Kellogg, and one of the big challenges for companies is not just the C-suite, but everything else, Let's just invite the industry in to help us prepare the curriculum so they know what they're getting. So Rush Presbyterian does Malcolm X's health care, and then we have Abbott, Baxter, Walgreens, Allscript, Children's Memorial Hospital. A person comes out of Malcolm X. There's no way Rush can't interview him, given you did the curriculum if they have a nursing degree. And rather than doors being slammed in your face because it says Malcolm X or it says Olive Harvey, the doors are going to be open because you did the curriculum. Because the community college did the curriculum. No, because the company did the curriculum. Because the company did the curriculum. Yes. I mean, in the same way that Dow influences how Kellogg does certain things for their MBA, UPS now does the training at uh, Olive Harvey on transportation, distribution, logistics. It's your curriculum. They came out in good standing. The door doesn't guarantee it's open but has a lot better shot at being open. And the average salary coming out of our community college now is $36,000. And the big thing for me is now we raise the minimum wage in Chicago. We just went up to 10 and we're on our way to 13. But if you're going to raise income levels for everybody, that community college 
degree has to be a ticket to so, a, a middle class life. I mean, when I walked out, and the other way I looked at it is, I went to Sarah Lawrence here in New York, and I went to uh, Northwestern for my graduate degree. What was it, really? Nobody sat there and said, tell me about your epistemology class. Sarah Lawrence had a reputation, and I traded on that. Northwestern had a reputation, and I traded on it. Well, I owe the men and women that go to Malcolm X or Olive Harvey that reputational that it opens the door, doesn't shut it. And if you're the mayor and you're responsible for it, I owe them the commitment. And I'll give you this one other anecdote, and then I'll shut up until the next question, uh, which is I met a young man on a train, and I'm walking and shaking hands and stuff like that. We were about to announce rebuilding the Red Line South. Uh, the whole piece of it, 11 miles, et cetera. I said, where are, you, where are you going? He goes, oh, I'm going to Target to work. I said, great, what do you do? He says, I work in the back, uh, warehouse operations, basically. I said, where you come from? He says, Malcolm X. And I said, oh, what, what are you getting your degree in? He says, business administration. And I walk away, and I just kind of know. He's working full-time, going to school full-time. He's got a certain view that if he gets a degree from Malcolm X, he's got X coming. He's doing exactly what you want him to do. Job, college, skill level up. Am I doing what I owe him? And the answer was no, I wasn't. And I owed him better. I'm the mayor. Community colleges is part of the mayoral responsibility. So we revamped the system. It was very early in my first term, and we revamped the system, and now making both the school relevant to employers and employees. And that's the goal. Let's talk about K-12, which obviously leads into it. You already mm -hmm. talked about it. Not just in Chicago, but nationally. You thought about this. I'm sure you think about this in your current job. You thought about this in your last job. How would Write you another article for the magazine. I'll call you also. <laughs> <laughs> how, would, how would you assess the school reform movement? So, so I understand that's an amorphous thing. But the school reform movement basically came on. Our four-letter words, no, no, OK. <laughs> our, our, came along and said, look, there are a lot of problems with schools. They're not just about money. Yeah, money's part of it, but they're not just about money. And we think there are ways to do better. And it has inspired, uh, I think some of the early claims were overblown. I also think there's been some real progress. Mm -hmm. There's been enormous uh, political controversy over mm -hmm. it. How would you assess, in the largest sense, is the school reform working, movement working? Well, as somebody who has pushed uh, certain things educationally, like full day kindergarten, Etc. Now, Chicago, when I became mayor, four, year ago, four years ago, our graduation rate was 57%. Last year, it was 70%, and according to the University of Chicago, we're on our way to 82%. Uh, that's just one measure. We now have uh, the best high schools in the state, according to the U.S. News World Report. Of the 10 top high schools, six are in the city of Chicago. Uh, here's what I would say to you, and this is not just to you, but this is what, I am not an education reformer. I don't buy it. I believe in quality. There's quality and not quality. I am not for charter versus neighborhood. I think that's a ridiculous argument. I'm for quality. And the thing I owe parents, and I'm mainly talking about high schools, but that's true about elementary schools as well, is quality. And the trick to quality, in my view, is not really a trick. It's the three things we know. And a principal who's ready and willing to be held accountable to, for quality education, a teacher who can motivate uh, children, and an involved parent. I don't care where a child comes from. I don't care what their background is. You put those three things together, and usually the combination to the lock gets done. And so what I say to reformers is, I'm not about reform. I'm about aspiring to quality education that has higher graduation rates, better test scores, and the ability to think and be, uh, uh, critically think and be creative. And that is what I am about. And so what I would say to the reformers is, well, I don't understand why you're about reform when you should be about what parents sit about when they think about what school they're gonna send their kid to or what neighborhood they're gonna move into to get part of that elementary school. They're looking for reform? No. They're looking for quality. How is the principle? And the reform, no disrespect, is like this kind of form. And I, I love you all. Don't, don't, don't. But that's, parents don't sit around when I go meet with parents and they're like, oh, we're going to move to this neighborhood. What are they asking for? Reform or quality? 
What do they like about that principal? Or what do they like about that, the teacher? Or we love, you know, so-and-so, our daughter had this eighth grade teacher, we want to make sure our son has that teacher. They're looking for quality. This is an intellectual debate about a couple thousand people around America. Think like a parent thinks about it. Think like you do. How many of you go to schools looking for reform? How many of you decide that you want to send your child to this high school or move to that neighborhood based on quality? And then have a discussion about what does it take to get to quality? I think it's a, like, don't get me started. So why is it proven? <laughs> Why is it? And it's an elite discussion that misses where parents are, where the real, where the rubber meets the road. It is an elite discussion. So, and we'll open it up to all of you in a minute. So, I think some aspects of it Obviously are. Obviously, I didn't take discussion. my medication this morning. Anyway. But <laughs> we, we we stole it. I just, we, we wanted you not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Leonhardt? No. <laughs> so some some of it. I think I agree is an elite discussion, but I think some of it's not. I mean, I think there is enormous. I, right. I mean, the mayor. I was trying to make a David. I was trying to make a point, to, uh, and clearly is. Yes, it's not all elite discussion, but if you, if you want people to be engaged in a, the most serious thing, or one of the top three most serious things facing the country, you have to have a discussion that they are actually right. thinking about in their terms, not our terms. Right. I've never had a parent, no, you've heard my point. So my thing is, then what are the things you have to do to create that quality universally across the city? And I'll tell you what I also think the reformers did wrong. It all, the reform became all about charter. So now the debate across the country in cities like mine is neighborhood versus charter. Well, that's not what's happening. Here's my view, and I'll give you, all right, so we have the largest international baccalaureate program now in the country, the largest military high school system in the country, the noble charter high school system that Eli Broad's foundation just said is the best charter operator. We have five of the top five high schools in the state. Their selective enrollment. Uh, we have five STEM high schools that go from ninth to 14th grade. All of those have 80 percent, uh, or they're beating the citywide average. And 50 percent of our kids now go to one of those three schools. To me, and I'm saying this as a mayor with mayoral control in schools, I owe parents quality. Their choices whether, and I have parents with kids that go to a selective enrollment here and an international baccalaureate for the other child here. What they have to know is that that school is quality and they're gonna make the right choice for every child. I'm a father of three, you're a father of three. three. All three children the same? No. They learn different? Yes. Okay, do one learns reform and the other one learns a different, <laughs> non-reform? Okay, this is so, I'm just saying, it's like, these are serious discussions that you're having and I'm not belittling them and I'm part of them. I read about it, I work on it as hard as somebody who gave up dance and wanted to be an early childhood educator, which served me well dealing with politicians, okay? <laughs> uh, I know that temper tamper, I've seen that before, okay? You're gonna, never mind. I, uh, uh, I guess, I, so that's my, that's the way I, I'm trying to, get, you know, as an elected official, you try to have a conversation and dialogue with where and how people think about something. And I know that the reform movement is important because it brought up and willing us all to challenge certain beliefs or things uh, that were walled off, and that's important. But in the end of the day, what I have seen is that the three things that count, regardless of the schools on the south side, west side, northwest side, southwest side, immigrant, indigenous neighborhood, et cetera, community that's been there for years, ethnically wide, et cetera, is a principal who welcomes parents into the schools, not just so kids could get dropped off, because a successful school says there's not a barrier between parents and the, and the front door of the classroom, or the front door of the school. Teachers who are energized thinking about not just teaching to test, but kids helping to think critically, and then uh, parents who even if they're told they get a drop off, walk through that door. The most important door, though, that a child walks through for their education is the front door of the home. Because at home, they learn the importance of education. At school, they learn an education, or they get an education. All kinds of stuff I want to follow up on, but I want to make good on the promise that I'm not the only one who gets to ask questions. And there's a number of questions that came in. I, you know, many of the questions that have come in, 
look at your ref the reforms that you're pursuing in Chicago. And did I not beat the word reform down? <laughs> <laughs> you need changes, another emotional outburst. Quality <laughs> enhancements. <The, the> quality <laughs> enhancements. Uh, uh -huh. These have obviously been somewhat controversial in Chicago. You've you've shut down a number of schools. Uh -huh. um, there's been an unusual level of protesting. There were some hunger strikers. Um, I, th I believe that the city recently announced that they would not be shutting down a high school that was a particular focus of protest. Diet. Right. Diet. How do you how do you think and how has the city grappled with the fact that there has been so much outspoken protest about the changes that are you you're making? Have you learned anything from the level of protest? Was it expected or unexpected? And what would you have done differently looking over the past? Well, couple of years, sir? first of all, let me say I don't know who asked, but I assume that's like a question that's like you said you got a number of questions, so that's kind of captures. So. If you're gonna make change, you know, I joked. I used to joke with President Obama. People hate the status quo. They're not too excited by change either. So they kind of got you right where you are, OK? <laughs> they hate what's going on. Well, that ain't too good either. So, And you have to figure that out, OK? Let me give you, uh, you said controversial, et cetera. When I became mayor, half the kids in the city of Chicago had a seven-hour kindergarten day and half had a three-and-a-half-hour day, four-hour day. And I would tell you, if you went through the demographics, the kids that were getting a seven hour a day probably could have afforded three hours a day, and the kids that were getting three hours a day needed seven hours a day. So I eliminated overtime at the uh, downtown office. Every child has a seven hour day, regardless of where they live, because I'm not gonna allow a child's early childhood years to depend on whether their parent is a good lobbyist. That's not allowed. <laughs> when I came to become mayor, the city of Chicago had the shortest school day and the shortest school year in America. Five and a half hour day. You were putting kids, 18 years old, 17 years old, 16 years old, on the streets of Chicago at 2.30, 2.40. It was such a great model, China and Japan were coming in to study it. <laughs> okay? We had a debate. And I said, I made a pledge. We are gonna have a full school day and a full school year for every child. Every child now receives two and a half more years of classroom time than they did under the old model. Nobody, and I take the L to, I take the train to work, walk around, nobody says, can we go back to the shortest day? Now, did we have a strike over it? Yes, there was a difference. There was a difference of opinion. But I made a pledge as an elected official running looking people in the eye and said, here's what I'm going to get done. Was it hard? Yes, it was, it was hard. Because I was asking a system to go from five and a half hours a day to seven hour a day. Who here, raise your hand, would like your kid to go to a five and a half hour a day? OK? And parents didn't want it. Parents didn't want it because they had to come out of work and figure out where do you, how do you get your child at 2.30 and you're at work to a safe place. Parents didn't want it because they knew instinctually as parents that a longer time in, in education was better. Was it controversial? It was controversial. Did people have a difference of opinion? Yes. Now, every school, because we have 400,000 kids and it's a pretty diverse city, that principal decided 30 minutes on reading, 20 minutes on science, and here's what we're going to do on enrichment. The other principal decided, they decided with their teachers how to allocate that hour of 15. My job as mayor was to get the children of the city of Chicago a full day. And you can't talk, hold on one second, sorry. <laughs> uh, you can't talk about aspirations towards post high school education if in your early years you're cheating. It's the largest increase in time anywhere in America ever. Is there anything you would have done differently given how much? I would have done this form and then would have done it. <laughs> uh, no, so let me also say here's, there's other pieces of this. Did I close? Uh, shutter 50 schools and then move the other 50 schools, the kids towards there. Let's do the end result. University of Chicago School on Urban Education. 93% of the kids now go to a better school and we made it within a mile or less from where they went. I'm not saying it was difficult because if somebody told me as a parent, your child will now have to go to this school or you can pick these three, I too would have been upset. But continuing sending kids to under-enrolled, underperforming schools and letting that happen 
when it was too politically difficult, even though people for years said we have to consolidate and more importantly, raise quality. I did not run into office to look at whether I could get reelected. And I knew when I did it, it was going to be controversial to the point of even political risk. Or I was going to spend my political capital to make sure that the children that, those, that were going to Chicago public schools had an improvement in their educational capacity and potential. That is why you run for office and you use the office. Can you find a nicer way where 50 schools are going to be consolidated and um, you're going to give it to, and make a change in people's life? When you figure that out, call me. Because it's not easy to do, but keeping kids in failure year after year is a lot harder because you pay for it in exponential ways later on. Let's take a question from the audience. <laughs> Did anyone have a, a question for the mayor? <laughs> Henry, Kissinger. It's, 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 Henry Kissinger had a great quote. Does anybody have any questions for my answers? <laughs> <laughs> right here, there's a microphone coming down to you, sir. Isn't that a great one? Only Kissinger can pull that one. Hey, I, I emailed this one in, but I'll ask it. So you said the corporations uh, help with the curriculum in community yeah. colleges? And labor. And labor? Yeah. Um, you said a lot of those kids go to four-year colleges. Are they able to transfer that community college education to the four-year college? Let me do uh, uh, the, uh, yes, short answer, but let me give you uh, the process we do now. We have dual credit, dual enrollment. So while you're in high school, you're allowed to get uh, college classes. We set that up uh, when I was mayor in 2011, there were 300 kids in either dual credit, dual enrollment. We're now at close to about 3,800. So while you're in high school, you're getting college classes, et cetera, and that's also part of the effort. Now remember that when I announced the B average, and this is the first year, I announced it a year ago, so this is the first group of kids. We just recently um, announced with the University of Illinois, Chicago, UIC, that if you maintain your B average, this is for the group of what we call Chicago Star Scholars, if you maintain your B average, they will automatically enroll you at UIC after the two years mainly sometimes these are really three, not two, right after that, with 2,500 off of the tuition. And in about two weeks from now, I'm sitting down with Chicago's Columbia, Roosevelt, Northeastern, and, I'm, and they all, all the presidents know why they're coming in. So I want to create a continuum, not just stopping my responsibility at high school, but if that's where the econo economy is, is that where the job market is, what am I doing to make sure that structurally, organizationally, we're preparing our kids for where the economy is? And so the second piece of this is, and it's too early because these are, literally the kids are only three weeks into the system, but we're going to make sure that they know, again, you have to maintain your educational standards. If you do it, there's a ticket to the next two years. Let me ask something on that because one the, some of the questions that have come in, there's one from um, Emeris Gutierrez, and I, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, asks, by focusing on much of the conversation is focused on vocational education, on practical skills, workplace skills. Is there a risk that particularly for low-income students who will be benefit most from this program, that they're getting shortchanged on the critical thinking skills, on the innovation skills, which we know that as the economy is changing, become disproportionately valuable mm -hmm. compared to more fungible, commoditizable skills? It's a, a really good question as somebody went to Sarah Lawrence and you know, I got a liberal arts degree. Uh, so yes and no, it's not that s simple. One of the big problems you have is uh, that I was trying to solve and Cheryl, who's the chancellor of community colleges, were our kids were spending time going, to, you know, taking classes that weren't relevant to what they're gonna need and uh, were just accumulating debt and it wasn't an edu they were kind of fumbling around educationally and it wasn't really what they needed. This allows us to focus them and guide them better. Now, one of the reasons, at least at the K through 12 level, we've gone international baccalaureate. Uh, U of C did a study showing that the IB program at our 13 schools was better than our best high schools at getting kids of color to college and to Ivy Leagues. By dramatic differences like 40, 50 percent. So then we went and now created seven schools that are all IB 
and we went from 13 to 19 schools that have IB programs. And what's IB? It's a liberal arts education of early, early year doing critical thinking. And so it's not one or the other. And you know, also in community colleges, you could be interested in healthcare and all of a sudden discover you really want to do social services. Kids can transfer to. You, you haven't hurt yourself there. But I, I don't know if it was Mr. or Mrs. Gutierrez that asked the question. It's a, uh, something we are cognizant of, on the other hand, we are trying to address a real shortfall that uh, was a problem in our community colleges. It's a fair question, very fair question. Thank you both very much. We oh, really appreciate you. I got like 20 more things I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. My mom had me when she was in high school. Um, so she, naturally, because she couldn't really support herself in high school, she ended up um, not finishing her um, last year of high school. And then the duties um, went over to my, my grandmother, who I call my nana. My mom is still very um, part of my life. Uh, however, just I've always been closer with my nana. I've lived with my nana. And I consider my, my nana really my mother. We are, haven't always been like financially sound. Uh, there's been many times where we've you know, struggled putting food on the table and stuff like that. But I also think that, you know, with those difficulties, we've had the chance to bond a lot. And I think maybe my nan and I are closer than what a lot of traditional families would be. My name is Casey Jones Hammond. I am from Hamilton, Montana. It's very rural, very small. It's about 4,500 people. Um, and my, I, my school is Hamilton High School. Entering my senior year, one of the things I decided I really want to do when I go to college is study abroad in Amman, Jordan, and learn Arabic.